been a longtime fan of Stephen King, but as someone who has spent a lot more time watching films than reading books, most of that appreciation was built by watching the adaptations of his works. King's first ever published novel went on to become a widely acclaimed and successful film that kicked off a steady stream of film and TV adaptations that have been going ever since. But with such a vast body of work from so many different filmmakers, there is inevitably a wide spectrum that those adaptations exist within. Everything from the terrible made-for-TV campfest to the fun popcorn movie and even to the level of cinematic masterpiece. This massive disparity all comes down to the director or the screenwriter. When in the hands of someone like Rob Reiner or Frank Darabont, King's stories can become some of the most beloved films of all time, but when in the wrong hands, they can turn into genre of schlock with no real substance. When dealing with any adaptation, a lot of the power of that story can get lost in translation, so those words need a proper caretaker. Within the last decade or so, we've been seeing a horror renaissance. Something I've briefly touched on in the past, but a name that I feel doesn't get enough attention is Mike Flanagan. I think he's one of the strongest voices in horror today and the perfect director for adapting Dr. Sleep. Growing up with a love of all things horror, he cited Stephen King as one of his earliest influences first discovering the novel It as a child, which led him down the path of reading the rest of King's bibliography, as well as discovering other horror writers like H.P. Lovecraft or Shirley Jackson, and eventually finding a new appreciation for the genre in film after seeing movies like The Exorcist, something that could capture that same feeling he got when reading a good novel, where the theater of the mind took over. But it wasn't until after graduating college, having made several student films about college dating angst, that he decided to lean on his horror roots for his own filmmaking, with a short film that he eventually adapted into a feature called Oculus, a story that already showed a lot of King's influence, relying on character and creating that theater of the mind more than relying on something like a jump scare. As a director, he knows that there is a time and place for genre elements to take the stage, but he knows that they should never be used as a crutch. Because I started off making these collegiate angst movies, character development was the first muscle I ever got to flex. I think that, coupled with my respect for Stephen King's work and how he does the same thing, leads me to want to focus more on character than anything else. This has to function first as a drama. If you do that, once you introduce the genre horror elements, they'll feel like natural extensions of those people, as opposed to this separate alien force that's becoming the star of the movie. This philosophy is evident across all of Flanagan's work. His stories, like King's, understand that the real monsters are people, the real demons are the ones that we carry with us, and the real terror comes from tapping into some inexplicable piece of our subconscious. This is what many of the lesser Stephen King adaptations are lacking, this fundamental human core, even amidst the macabre. There can be no horror if there isn't caring and love. That's very important, and I think a lot of filmmakers miss that, and uh, Mike doesn't. Mike, Mike understands. Whether he's adapting pre-existing material like with The Haunting of Hill House, or writing his own original stories like with Midnight Mass, he always pulls the focus tightly onto the characters, and we watch as families cope with loss, we see the struggles of fatherhood, alcoholism, spirituality, all of the same themes that are evident throughout Stephen King's writing. In its best expression, horror is the safe space for us to take a hard look at the darkest corners of who we are. To me, it's about so much more than scaring you in a dark theater. But underneath it all, it's a catharsis that isn't about indulging these dark ideas, it's, it's about confronting them. Confronting darkness is at the core of some of King's greatest work, whether that's facing off against a bully or a tyrant, struggling through our relationship with our parents, with our children, or dealing with past traumas. And Flanagan has used the medium of film to try and tackle that same subject matter, but Dr. Sleep presented a unique challenge as an adaptation. The Shining is a rare type of film, 
While notoriously panned at release by critics and Stephen King himself, it has since gone on to become one of the most influential and significant films of all time. But it was in many ways a very different story than what King had originally written. I always felt that Kubrick's movie was chilly. There's a feeling of beauty that's in a snow globe. His movie ended in ice and my book ended in fire. In his novel, King saw himself as Jack, a fundamentally good man who is slowly corrupted by this place, but finds a sense of redemption before the end, breaking free from that influence long enough to allow his wife and son's escape by burning it all down. It's easy to see why King felt disappointed in Kubrick's adaptation, because if Jack was just a proxy for King to study his own inner darkness, the feelings of anger towards his own children, and how alcohol could fuel that anger. Kubrick's version offers Jack a much less hopeful ending. As a filmmaker who had adapted other works before this, Kubrick knew that he would have to make changes for the sake of the film. He didn't have the same personal attachment to the novel the way that King did, and he used it as more of a guideline to create his own world, to try and break new ground in the horror genre. So we lose a lot of backstory that's in the novel, there's a lot more ambiguity surrounding Tony and the nature of The Shining or the history of The Overlook, and there are many other notable changes that Kubrick made to give the story a darker turn, including the death of Dick Halloran and the nature of Jack's demise. But I think if we compare the reception of Kubrick's film to the considerably more faithful miniseries, it's clear that following the source material doesn't inherently make for a better film. So even though Stephen King's Doctor Sleep follows his own original novel as a direct sequel without paying any mind to Kubrick's vision, Mike Flanagan knew that it would be a mistake to abandon everything that Kubrick had built. So all of the actors were cast for the resemblance to the original characters, the music makes use of many of the same motifs, and the cinematography and the camera work follow a lot of the same principles with long, slow-moving shots or centered framing, its use of soft dissolves. They even spent a lot of time and money to recreate the Overlook exactly as it was in Kubrick's film, albeit with some added degradation. It's all used to bring us back into this world, to feel a true sense of continuity between what Kubrick had depicted and the present story of a grown-up Dan Torrance. If we don't feel like these two actors are the same person, then the whole story falls apart. Because those details aren't just cheap callbacks to a beloved classic, they are at the core of the character and the story we see in Doctor Sleep. Watching the boy who suffered a great trauma grow up to follow in his father's footsteps, continuing the cycle of abuse and self-destruction, and ultimately how he tries to break free from that cycle. While Kubrick maintained a lot of ambiguity surrounding the nature of The Shining itself, we do learn that it's something many people have, though they don't know it or believe it, and we see how it works to some degree, allowing people to communicate telepathically or to see things from both past and future. And while it's never explicitly stated, Kubrick's film does provide an answer to the question of what's real and what isn't. We know that whatever these ghosts may be, that the Overlook does possess a tangible power to affect the real world. Pictures in a book. We said they were just pictures in a book and they couldn't hurt me. The Overlook, it was always just pictures to me. But I didn't shine like you. You made it real. Started as soon as you walked through the door. World's a hungry place. And the darkest things are the hungriest, and they'll eat what shines. Swarm it like mosquitoes or leeches. Can't do nothing about that. The true knot are just another manifestation of the same inherent evil that possessed the Overlook, with that same dark appetite for steam. They've roamed the land for thousands of years, feeding on the pain of children that shine. Empty devils endlessly chasing an unquenchable thirst. They are darkness manifested into flesh, the same darkness that got into Jack. Because at the core of both The Shining and Doctor Sleep, the core of most stories, is the battle between light and dark. 
Daddy tried to kill me. It wasn't all him. You gotta know that place fed his dark like it fed on your light. And he had some light in him, too. Just like you got some dark. We all got both. Following Dan into adulthood, it's clear that he's been losing that battle, falling into the same cycle of alcoholism, violence, and self-destruction that killed his father. But he hits rock bottom, eventually finding sobriety and a sense of purpose that sees him using his shine again for something good, helping to ease the fears of those about to die, assuring them of the meaning that their lives had, and instilling hope in what lies on the other side. We don't end, Charlie. I know that for certain. He's able to do what his father couldn't, to set aside his anger, to put down the bottle, and to find a path towards living a meaningful life. But that life and that chance at redemption wouldn't have been possible without the sacrifice of another. Why me? Because she found you. Because she showed up. Hell, Doc, why me? You just walked on into my kitchen one day, and I'm still on the hook. I'm here because it all comes round. Ka's a wheel, Doc. In the world of Stephen King, Ka, or the Will of Gan, is essentially fate or destiny. It's been described as a wheel whose sole purpose is to turn. And the only way to change your fate is to learn from the past and to make some significant change in behavior to break that cycle. A reframing of the old adage, if we don't learn from our history, then we are doomed to repeat it. I think that this theme lies at the center of both of these stories, echoed in the fact that the Overlook itself was built on an Indian burial ground, a mass grave of those unjustly killed and mirrored further by the quasi-immortal psychic vampires who have been ritualistically killing for millennia. Throughout time, there have always been those that fall into darkness and do terrible things, but Halloran shows how that cycle can be temporarily broken by taking a stand against evil. And I think that placing that responsibility on his shoulders rather than on Jack's must carry a much heavier weight for Danny later in life. He didn't get to see that glimmer of his true father again, sacrificing himself to protect them. The last memory he'll ever have of his father is running through the maze and leaving him to die. And in a strange way, Kubrick's alterations add new depth to what Dr. Sleep is all about, strengthening the core themes beyond what even King had envisioned. Because Jack never found his redemption in Kubrick's film, it creates a greater sense of urgency for Dan to avoid making the same mistakes, to atone for the inherited sins of the father and everything else left unreconciled at the end of The Shining. Because while Jack dies in both the book and the film, the specific nature of his death changes everything giving him a glimpse of humanity, showing that light shining through in his final moments, leaves them with some hope. There would still be trauma, of course, for both Danny and Wendy, but there could be some catharsis too, because he fought off the darkness long enough to make a difference. Dan is haunted by the ghosts of his past in more ways than one, and this version of the past creates a lot more darkness for Dan to have to see his way through because we see the weight he carries with him, how it's affected his life after the Overlook, how his mother can't even look him in the eyes because all she sees is Jack. Thinking about Dad. No, I'm not. You are. You don't want to. So he uses his shine to change that for her, and then buries it underneath the depression and the alcohol and the violence and anything else that can get him further away from the voices in his head. And it's a way of feeling closer to his father, a man who he knew had some light until he let the darkness grow too deep, because he makes a choice that seals his fate. Man takes a drink. The drink takes a drink. And then the drink takes a man. Ain't it so, Dad? 
But like the old proverb tells us, its very presence creates the taste for more. A hunger that we know will never be satisfied, but only grow stronger the more that we indulge, leaving an endless longing in its absence. One of the most powerful scenes in Doctor Sleep is one of Mike Flanagan's own creation. It's the scene that convinced Stephen King that the film needed to revisit The Overlook, to get that final sense of closure we never got from Kubrick's film. The concept of how Jack was brought back was devised through Kubrick's own depiction of the mythology. As producer Trevor Macy explained, the idea that we always call him the bartender is little part Lloyd, little part Jack, is a nod to how Kubrick handled Delbert Grady, who may or may not have been the caretaker. That kind of ambiguity we felt like was central to the mythology, with Mike Flanagan adding, he made it clear that when the hotel digests you and you're a part of the hotel, Delbert always denied who he was. He was just a waiter. Even as Jack Torrance called him out and said, Grady? Yes, sir. You're Delbert Grady. You killed your family. He said, you've mistaken me for someone else. That's strange, sir. I don't have any recollection of that at all. That was the key to Jack. It's a scene that works first and foremost within the mythology of the world that they've built, but it also works to complement the theme that's been running throughout both films, because Jack, or Lloyd, is really a manifestation of the hotel, and in the subtextual language of the film, a manifestation of addiction. And it allows him to come face to face with the same temptation that consumed his father with that siren song luring him towards the darkness. Medicine is what it is. Bonafide cure-all. Depression, stress, remorse, failure wipes it all away. So tell me, pup, are you gonna take your medicine? I'm not. This is where Dan is able to make the change that Jack couldn't. He refuses to take the drink and remains strong in his convictions to stay sober and to protect Abra, despite the same sort of bargain being presented by the face of the Overlook. And as much as I love this film, this is the one point that I'm most critical of. Because the Overlook and all of those starving old ghosts are a symbol for Jack's addiction, and drinking is the ritualistic act the conduit for allowing the evil of the Overlook to fully consume him, something we see directly mirrored with the True Knot, indulging in their own appetites and making their own deal with the devil. So I think we lose some of that symbolic resonance when Dan becomes possessed by the hotel despite refusing that temptation. And considering this turn is ultimately unnecessary to the story, it is the one and only thing I wish was changed. But it's a small complaint in the grand scheme of things, because with exception to this one flaw, I think that what we see in Flanagan's film delivers something even more meaningful than what King had on the page. In The Shining, it's clear that that one drink ends up costing Jack his life in both versions of the story. But Kubrick's Overlook didn't just take his life, it took his soul. Jack is now a prisoner that will be forever trapped as long as the hotel is still standing. So this ending becomes about so much more than just saving Abra, which makes for a satisfying conclusion in its own right in King's novel, but Kubrick created a film that canonically leaves a lot of unfinished business, like a song ending on a chord that never resolves, leaving those dissonant harmonies ringing out for Dan's entire life, even through to his mother's death. I was 20 when she died, and back then, when someone was gonna die, I saw flies circling people's faces. And in those last weeks, she was covered. I could barely see her eyes. And I, tr I tried to comfort her, but I could hardly look at her. And she saw that. She just lay there dying with her son who couldn't look at her. Jack's act of sin cost him everything, but it cost Wendy and Danny everything too, because she could never find peace knowing what her son might turn into, and despite Dan trying to shut out the voices or the visions, it was only a matter of time before he was manifesting the same darkness as his father, a darkness that spilled out into his world, staining those final moments with his mother with feelings of guilt and regret. 
and he had begun to follow the same path as his father, led astray by all of the same temptations. But when confronted with that temptation in this critical moment, he was able to make the choice that altered the course of his fate, that ever-turning wheel of Ka. His refusal meant that the Overlook couldn't fully take hold of him like it did his father, allowing him to keep the boiler running and to let it all burn, setting everyone free in the process. Because he breaks both cycles, killing the last of the True Knot and saving Abra, but by burning that old hungry place to the ground, he also freed all of those trapped souls, that of his father and even his mother sharing one last moment together where they finally look each other in the eyes. Kubrick obviously wrote his adaptation with no expectation of a sequel, and there is nothing about his film that feels incomplete, but on the emotional level for the lives of these characters, there is a vast emptiness that was left behind in the wake of these changes. Because neither Wendy nor Dan ever saw the true light of the man that they loved ever again because Halloran's death left Wendy without a much-needed friend who understood what they went through and instead had to navigate that path alone, and because the source of all of that evil was still very much alive. But not every filmmaker would recognize these unintentional gaps created by Kubrick and see the opportunities that they presented. Maintaining a consistency in its mythology to bring back some of these familiar elements, but most importantly, by following the emotional thread of these people and retaining that emotional connective tissue that ties both films together, that of the father who failed his son and the son who ultimately redeems his father. It's a rare thing. Not many would have the audacity to try and make a sequel to such an unparalleled masterpiece, but far fewer could actually deliver something as special as Mike Flanagan did with this film. He set himself up with an impossible task of staying true to the separate visions of two undeniable masters of their craft, while still making something that could stand as a solid film in its own right, which should have been an impossible balancing act and likely would have been in anyone else's hands. But it's why, minor complaints aside, I think it is truly one of the great modern horror films. It's easily one of the best Stephen King adaptations in existence, and just one of the many reasons that Mike Flanagan is one of my absolute favorite filmmakers working at the moment. It was an incredibly ambitious idea to try and come back to this world, and it's a sequel that I initially was highly skeptical of, one that sadly most critics and audiences didn't seem to adore as much as I do. But I believe it does the best thing that any sequel or adaptation can do. Mike's movie does two things. It's a fine adaptation of Dr. Sleep, but it's also a terrific sequel to Stanley Kubrick's movie, The Shining. It could have been baggage, but instead it's a dividend. It enriches, and I don't know about anybody else how anybody's gonna feel about it, but for me, it was great to go back to the Overlook. It was great to go back.